Last week, we discussed antibiotic prophylactic updates for patients with joint replacements. Is there anything new regarding bacterial endocarditis? Find out today on Medical History Mysteries. Palm. What does that mean? What's up with bacterial endocarditis and antibiotic prophylaxis? The confusion abounds. Man, it's, 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 it's absolutely mind blowing how confused everybody else is about whether or not I should prophylax, what antibiotic or antibacterial agent I should use to prophylax with. What about clindamycin? What about the American Heart Association? What about second generation and third generation cephalosporins? This one actually deserves two. Okay, so <laughs> what do you think, Pam? Give me, give me your take. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, all right. This is gonna sound probably kind of terrible, but it seems like the concern for antibiotic prophylaxis is becoming less and less when it comes to heart conditions. People seem so up in arms regarding joint replacements, but it seems like, heart conditions just keep getting checked off the list that require it. So I feel like fewer and fewer times people need it, or they maybe had a condition that you're like, your red flag goes up and they're like, I've never taken an antibiotic. No one's ever told me I needed one. I'm 40 years old. Why do I need one now? So I know I, I feel, I feel your face palm. <laughs> so, okay. To start, the American Heart Association uh, publishes in circulation back in 2021 the following, and I'll read it verbatim, okay? Compared with previous recommendations, there are currently relatively few patient cell populations for whom antibiotic prophylaxis may be indicated prior to dental procedures. Okay, so they're telling you up front, it's not for everyone. We don't prophylax for mitral valve prolapse anymore. And for things we haven't prophylaxed for since 27, for 20, 2007, as a matter of fact, was the last time we ever uh, revised the guidelines to that extent. So it's been a while. What does the American Heart Association consider to be guidelines when it comes to who should be selected? Who's in this patient population? And they give specifics on patient selection. They say what? Where prosthetic materials have been used. Anyone with a history of infective endocarditis. Anybody with congenital heart disease. Those are the overarching groups, okay? Now, they make it a little more specific. They say, if you have a prosthetic cardiac valve, okay? Uh, or some type of implanted prosthesis. If you have a prosthetic material that was used to replace a cardiac valve, Okay, or replace, repair a cardiac valve, um, or annual opacity rings and cords. If you have a history of infective endocarditis, regardless, okay, or if you're a transplant patient, a cardiac transplant patient with valve regurgitation due to perhaps a structurally abnormal valve, okay, and anyone with a congenital, meaning present from birth heart disease, okay, could be unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease, or it could be uh, any repaired congenital heart defect with residual sunts or some valvular regurgitation, whether maybe it was even the use of a prosthetic patch or a prosthetic device. That's not a lot of people compared to what we used to prophylax for. It really is a small subset. So that's the first source of confusion. The second source of confusion is, all right, this patient is a good candidate for infective endocarditis prophylaxis. What agent should I be using? Okay, well, we all know it's amoxicillin as our old standby, right? Um, what if you can't use amoxicillin? What if you're unable to take oral medication? Well, the guidelines say use ampicillin or cefazolin or ceftriaxone I am or IV, because you just happen to have those laying around a dental office at all times. So sure, start up an I am or an IV. Why not? That sounds good. Where it gets even more confusing is if the patient's allergic to penicillin. 
Okay, what are my options? First up, cephalexin, keflex. But you know, there is this cross sensitivity thing. No one really knows how much it is. Is it 10%, 5%, 1%? There is the potential since they're so structurally similar that you could be allergic to penicillin and also therefore be allergic to cephalosporins. This became an issue for me at a dental conference where a speaker approached me and said, you got that all wrong, Viola. I went to someone else's uh, presentation and they said that if you can't use cephalexin because of the potential for cross sensitivity with the, uh, the amoxicillins and the penicillins of the world, then you can use a third generation cephalosporin or a second generation cephalosporin. And the one they mentioned specifically was cephalochlor or seclor, second generation cephalosporin, less likely to have the same cross sensitivity. Or use ceftonir omniceph. That's a third generation cephalosporin. Also, again, not as much cross sensitivity with penicillins. And you screwed up, Viola. You should have said that in your lecture. The thing is, Pam, if the guidelines wanted you to use a second generation cephalosporin, they would have specified that. And if they wanted you to use a third generation cephalosporin like Omnicef, they would have specified that. What they said was it's either cephalexin or cephazolin, a first generation cephalosporin, or ceftriaxone, a third generation cephalosporin. Now, I may want to use amoxicillin. Finding out that I can't, I may want to use a cephalosporin that I can use for a patient who can't use it because they may be allergic to a cephalosporin. Well, this second or third generation cephalosporin that I heard in this lecture would be just fine for that. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to stray from the guidelines? The guidelines are the guidelines. If you're going to follow the guidelines, then follow the guidelines. So I didn't have the heart to correct her in front of a group of other speakers, but the point was that's information that's out there now. 500 people maybe attended that course that day and heard, it's okay to use cephalochlor. It's okay to use, you know, uh, sepdinir. No one ever said that. Again, you're the doc. I can't tell you what to do, but I know one thing. If I'm trying or attempting to follow the guidelines, then I will follow the guidelines. Okay. So let's but say you, you yes. said something though. You said not as much, meaning you can, you know, you've got moxicillin, you've got cephalosporins, you have an allergic to your an allergy to penicillin. So there's a risk for cross allergenicity with cephalosporins, but there's not as much with some of these. Like I don't want to be hanging my hat on a not as much. So I, I feel like for me, if you're allergic to a penicillin, to a moxicillin, I'm probably going to check cephalosporins off the list. Am I being too conservative? That's the reason for the second palm slap, okay? We're complicating our lives as dental professionals and then justifying why. Why would you want to do that? The guidelines are clearly guidelines. First of all, they're not regulations, they're not laws, they're guidelines. If you choose to follow the guidelines, which you don't have to, then follow the guidelines. Why run the risk of, hey, I did the right thing. I followed the guidelines. I want to have some smart aleck attorney three years from now say, you didn't exactly follow the guidelines. Here's what you should have used. And here's what you decided to use because you attended some lecture or some speaker said it was OK. So this it kind of leads to or alludes to the greater idea, which is whenever you attend a course and the speaker says something that leaves you scratching your head like you just did, man then maybe you should do your own research, okay? So let's rule out, because I'm with you, let's take out cephalexin as a potential, all cephalosporins as a potential. I can understand why you'd have a problem with that. Why? Because the next up is azithromycin or clarithromycin. Now the macrolides are good antibacterial agents. Don't get me wrong. You can use them as bactericidal or bacteriostatic agents, depending on the dose. But azithromycin, Man, are we going to get feedback, you and I, about the next statement I'm going to make. Ready? Because here it comes. I'm going to say it, and I would say duck for cover, okay? Azithromycin has been linked in some case reporting to arrhythmia. <gasps> Boy, are you going to get comments about this? I, it's coming. I would do the same. Duck for cover. Bam, here, here. I'm hiding. I'm officially hiding. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this tongue in cheek and poking fun with love at my other dental professionals who have a right to feel whatever they want. I get it. OK, so I'm just sort of saying that as, oh, boy, is that controversial all on its own? OK. 
All right. Now, there have been studies that have proven that doesn't cause QT prolongation and, and Tosad's the point. Okay, I get all that, but potentially. Why do I care? Oh, so it potentially causes arrhythmia. Because we use drugs in dentistry, like local anesthetic agents, that increase the risk of, ar of arrhythmia. People take medications like Seroquel that increase the risk of arrhythmia. Yeesh, why would I want to do that? Okay. What's your next option then? Doxycycline. Doxycycline is bacteriostatic. And let's face it, we really don't use it in dentistry that much. So there you have it. Okay, those are your options. So I get why people are confused. And if you're allergic to penicillin as a patient and unable to take oral medications, I would say get out. You're really complicated. I don't need you in my day. No, I'm just kidding. So I would say what? I would say, again, cefazolin or ceftriaxone, I am or IV. I don't just happen to have those laying around. So, you know, that requires me to follow up with a general practitioner and work out something so you can get those drugs in advance. Bottom line is I get the confusion, but I also understand the group is small, and I get that your choice of agents has become limited because of the reduction of clindamycin or, re or removing clindamycin from the list. But come on, Pam, you and I both know clindamycin is a good drug. Yes, it can cause C. diff related complications, which can be fatal. But if we're following up with our patients like we should be, and we're making sure that at the first sign of diarrhea, we're advising them to seek treatment because it may be C. diff related. Yes, it can lead to death quickly, but if we're on top of it and monitoring our patients like we should be, we can get them to seek assistance immediately. Okay, as I said in our last webcast, you really wanna die on that hill? Do you really want to fight and say, you don't meet the requirements for infective endocarditis and therefore I'm not gonna prescribe it. I don't care what your cardiologist says, yikes. This is an even more difficult decision to stand to take. Why? Because a, pub, a study published in 2022 from Thornhill et al. said what? 8 million, I think it was even closer to 9 million patients were studied. And there was a direct correlation between invasive dental procedures and infective endocarditis in patients who were at risk for infective endocarditis. And the same study proved what? Using antibiotics as prophylaxis decreased that risk. I don't know how to argue with that kind of data. Wow. Again, you know, this is a, a lot for us to digest. It's interesting because these guidelines have been out for so long and they just keep changing on us. So I guess we just need to keep an eye out, stay tuned, follow you and follow Medical History Mysteries and hopefully we'll keep you all up to date. Sounds like a plan to me. Thank you, everybody. Me too. See you all next week.